A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the Holy Ones and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the capstone. Through him, the whole structure is held together and grows into a temple sacred in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Responsorial Psalm. Go out to all the world and tell the good news. Go out to all the world and tell the good news. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Glorify him, all you peoples. Go out to all the world and tell the good news. For steadfast is his kindness for us, and the fidelity of the Lord endures forever. Go out to all the world and tell the good news. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands. Bring your hand, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. The Gospel of the Lord. You, it's one thing to be able to kind of make a boast, and then another thing to kind of realize, you know what, it's not a boast after all, it's actually true. So you can think of some of the early fights. For example, I was thinking of Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. You know, I am the greatest. Well, guess what? Turned out he was, you know? And so what would be maybe an exaggerated remark toward the beginning unfolds, unfolds. And it turns out it's expressive of more truth than we might have thought at the first. The same thing is true with confession of Jesus Christ as Lord, okay? It can be, in the very beginning, just another way of saying, he's the greatest, he's up there, okay? And so we hear the Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2 where Peter says, let the whole house of Israel know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Mm. You can go from there to the letter to the Philippians, the famous canticle there, where every tongue shall proclaim, Jesus Christ is Lord. We're making a step up and a step up and a step up. Now we come to the last of those kinds of statements in the New Testament in terms of chronology. My Lord and my God. And that is what would be an example in rhetoric of a Hendiades, really, okay? Two terms that are actually the same thing being brought together. My Lord, you are God. Wow. 
okay? And there's a confession of faith that is the capstone confession of faith, not only for John's gospel, but really for the whole New Testament. This statement is even stronger than the Word was in the beginning with God, okay? Or, the, you know, the Word was God, for reasons I won't go into that are grammatical and have to do with the Greek. That statement isn't as strong as this one. And it makes sense in its own way, I think, to have a strong statement at the beginning and an even stronger one at the end. So here we celebrate a tremendous act of faith and we see the growth in the depth of the understanding of who is Jesus just in the terms of the New Testament. So we can thank God for that faith as we continue our fortnight for freedom. This excerpt from the Declaration on Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae, says this. In turn, where the principle of religious freedom is not only proclaimed in words or simply incorporated in law, but also given sincere and practical application, there the church succeeds in achieving a stable situation of right as well as a fact and the independence which is necessary for the fulfillment of her divine mission. This independence is precisely what the authorities of the church claim in society. At the same time, the Christian faithful, in common with all other men, possess the civil right not to be hindered in leading their lives in accordance with their conscience. Therefore, a harmony exists between the freedom of the church and the religious freedom, which is to be recognized as the right of all men and communities and sanctioned by constitutional law. And so our bishops reflect and say, while insisting upon the religious freedom of the church, the Council Fathers do not wish to give the impression that in some manner the Catholic Church is special when it comes to religious liberty. I will only make the observation that that was precisely the point upon which the conservative minority would reject this document because they absolutely believed that that was the case, that the Catholic Church does get priority and special treatment. Okay? On the argument, error has no rights that's one of the big issues of our split away group, the Society of St. Pius X. They do not agree that people should have religious freedom across the board. The church thinks differently. Thus the council first states that where the principle of religious liberty is present, the church is able to peaceably fulfill her divine mission. It is this amicable relationship between herself and civil authorities that the church always wishes to pursue and ensure. In the light of this, the church also champions the religious and civil rights of all, so that all people can live their lives in accordance with their conscience. In this way, there is no conflict with what the church demands for herself and what she demands for others, the freedom to follow one's conscience in matters religious. This religious freedom for all is what the council once more believes should be acknowledged and sanctioned within the constitutional law of countries. In the United States, religious freedom is protected in the Constitution as the Council desires. Are those constitutional protections enough? Are they growing stronger or weaker in our society today? What else, apart from the law, can strengthen or weaken religious liberty? What should Catholics do to defend and foster religious liberty in America today? What have Catholics done in the past when religious liberty was threatened? Let us stand and pray.